Chapter 3, The Biosphere. Chapter 3-1, What is Ecology? Floods hit Texas, wildfires charred three states, drought withers Florida. Such news often flashes across television screens, newspapers, and the internet. We are fascinated and frightened by these natural events, but there are other stories as well. Some tell, some tell projects to restore wetlands in southern Florida and along the Mississippi River for the purpose of controlling floods and droughts. Others report on improvements in air and water quality as a result of changes in the gasoline that we put in our cars. Like all organisms, we interact with our environment. To understand these interactions better and to learn how to control them, we, we turn to the science called ecology. Interactions and Interdependence Ecology is a scientific study of interactions among organisms and between organisms and their environment or surroundings. The word ecology was coined in 1866 by the German biologist Ernest Haeckel. Haeckel based this term on the Greek word oikos, meaning house, which is also the root of the word economy. Haeckel saw the living world as a household with an economy in which each organism plays a role. Nature's houses come in many sizes, from single cells to the entire planet. The largest of these houses is called the biosphere. The biosphere contains the combined portion, portions of this planet in which all life exists, including land, water, and air, or atmosphere. It extends from about 8 kilometers above Earth's surface to as far as 11 kilometers below the surface of the ocean. Interactions within the biosphere produce a web of interdependence between organisms and the environment in which they live. Whether it occurs on the top of a glacier in a forest or deep within an ocean trench, the interdependence of life on Earth contributes to an ever-changing or dynamic biosphere. Levels of Organization To understand relationships within the biosphere, ecologists ask questions about events and organisms that range in complexity from a single individual to the entire biosphere. Some ecologists study interactions between a particular kind of organism and its surroundings. Such studies focus on the species level. A species is a group of organisms so similar to one another that they can breed and produce fertile offspring. Other ecologists study populations, or group of individuals that belong in the same species and live in the same area. Still, other ecologists study communities, or assemblages of different populations that live together in a defined area. Ecologists may study a particular ecosystem. An ecosystem is a collection of all the organisms that live in a particular place, together with their non-living or physical environment. Larger systems called biomes are also studied by teams of ecologists. A biome is a group of ecosystems that have the same climate and similar dominant communities. The highest level of organization that ecologists study is the entire biosphere itself. Ecological methods. Ecologists use a wide range of tools and techniques to study the living world. Some, like scientists, use binoculars and field guides to assess changes in plant and wildlife communities. Others use studies of DNA to identify bacteria in the mud of coastal marshes. Still others use radio tags to track migrating wildlife or use data gathered by satellites. Regardless of the tools they use, scientists conduct modern eco ecological research using three basic approaches, observing, experimenting, and modeling. All of these approaches rely on the application of scientific methods to guide ecological inquiry. Observing. Observing is often the first step in asking ecological questions. Some observations are simple. What species live here? How many individuals of each species are here? Other observations are more complex and may form the first step in designing ex experiments and models. Experimenting. Experiments can be used to test hypotheses. An ecologist may set up an artificial environment in a laboratory to imitate and manipulate condi conditions that organisms would encounter in the natural world. Other experiments are conducted within natural ecosystems. Modeling. Many ecological phenomena occur over long periods of time or on such large spatial scales that they are difficult to study. Ecologists make models to gain insight into complex phenomena such as the effects of global warming on ecosystems. Many ecological models consist of mathematical formulas based on data collected through observation and experimentation. The predictions made by ecological models are often tested by further observations and experiments. Chapter 3-2 Energy Flow At the core of every organism's interaction with the environment is its need for energy to power life's processes. Consider, for example, the energy that ants use to carry objects many times their size or the energy that birds use to migrate thousands of miles. 
Think about the energy that you need to get out of the bed in the morning. The flow of energy through an ecosystem is one of the most important factors that determines the system's capacity to sustain life. Producers. Without a constant input of energy, living systems cannot function. Sunlight is the main energy source of life on Earth. Of all the sun's energy that reaches Earth's surface, only a small amount, less than 1%, is used by living things. This seemingly small amount is enough to produce as much as 3.5 kilograms of living tissue per square meter a year in some tropical forests. In a few ecosystems, some organisms attain energy from a source other than sunlight. Some types of organisms rely on the energy stored in inorganic chemical compounds. For instance, mineral water that flows underground or boils out of hot springs and undersea vents is loaded with chemical energy. Only plants, some algae, and certain bacteria can capture energy from sunlight or chemicals and use that energy to produce food. These organisms are called autotrophs. Autotrophs use energy from the environment to fuel the assembly of simple inorganic compounds into complex organic molecules. These organic molecules combine and recombine to produce living tissue. Because they make their own food, autotrophs, like kelp, are also called producers. Both types of producers, those that capture energy from sunlight and those that capture chemical energy, are essential to the flow of energy through the biosphere. Energy from the sun. The best known autotrophs are those that harness solar energy through a process known as photosynthesis. During photosynthesis, these autotrophs use light energy to power chemical reactions that convert carbon dioxide and water into oxygen and energy-rich carbon hydrates such as sugars and starches. This process is responsible for adding oxygen to and removing carbon dioxide from Earth's atmosphere. In fact, were it not for phyto- photosynthetic autotrophs, the air would not contain enough oxygen for you to breathe. On land, plants are the main autotrophs. In freshwater ecosystems and in the sunlit upper layers of the ocean, algae are the main autotrophs. Photosynthetic bacteria, the most common of which are the cyanobacteria, are important in certain wet ecosystems such as tidal flats and salt marshes. Life without light. Although plants are the most visible and best known autotrophs, some autotrophs can produce food in the absence of light. Such autotrophs rely on energy within the chemical bonds of inorganic molecules such as hydrogen sulfide. When organisms use chemical energy to produce carbon hydrates, the process is called chemosynthesis. This process is performed by several types of bacteria. Surprisingly, these bacteria represent a large proportion of living autotrophs. Some chemosynthetic bacteria live in very remote places on Earth, such as volcanic vents on the deep ocean floor and hot springs in Yellowstone Park. Others live in more common places, such as tidal marshes along the coast. Consumers. Many organisms, including animals, fungi, and many bacteria, cannot harness energy directly from the physical environment as autotrophs do. The only way these organisms can acquire energy is from other organisms. Organisms that rely on other organisms for their energy and food supply are called heterotrophs. Heterotrophs are also called consumers. There are many different types of heterotrophs. Herbivores obtain energy by eating only plants. Some herbivores are cows, caterpillars, and deer. Carnivores, including snakes, dogs, and owls, eat animals. Humans, bears, crows, and other omnivores eat both plant and animal. Detritivores, such as mites, earthworms, snails, and crabs, feed on plant and animal remains and other dead matter, collectively called detritus. Another important group of heterotrophs called decomposers breaks down organic matter. Bacteria and fungi are decomposers. Feeding relationships. What happens to the energy in an ecosystem when one organism eats another? That energy moves along a one-way path. Energy flows through an ecosystem in one direction, from the sun or in, in, or inorganic compounds to autotrophs, producers, and then to various heterotrophs, consumers. The relationships between producers and consumers connect organisms into feeding networks based on who eats whom. Food chains. The energy stored by producers can be passed through an ecosystem along a food chain, a series of steps in which organisms transfer energy by eating and being in, eaten. For example, in a prairie ecosystem, a food chain might consist of a producer, such as grass, that is fed upon by a herbivore, such as a grazing antelope. The herbivore is, in turn, fed upon by a carnivore, such as a coyote. In this situation, the carnivore is only two steps removed from the producer.
In some marine food chains, the producers are microscopic algae that are eaten by very small organisms called zooplankton. The zooplankton, in turn, are eaten by small fish such as herring. The herring are eaten by squid, which are ultimately eaten by large fish just such as sharks. In this food chain, the top car carnivore is four steps removed from the producer. 